It's easy to become a Body Kindness Insider. Just visit bodykindnessbook.com and click Get Started on the homepage. Give your name and email and you'll get instant access to my free e-course. You're going to get a video about five health rules to break. I'm also going to give you a reflection and goals packet. You'll get a free chapter of my book, Body Kindness, if you don't have it already. And you're going to get one of my clients' favorite tools, and it's awareness building health and happiness journal that allows you to observe your day-to-day body kindness progress without counting calories, wearing trackers, and all those other things that just end up making you feel not good enough. Plus, you're going to get my tips and best inspirations over email. So if you're not yet a body kindness insider, visit bodykindnessbook.com click get started, sign up. You can get going on your journey right away. And I will be sending you some check-in emails, including an invitation to our free Facebook group that is just for body kindness insiders. I'll see you there. You know, the practice of body kindness is not exactly effortless. Okay, let's just be real. It doesn't matter if you are on day one and are probably feeling really overwhelmed. And you know what? You just got to ask the people who have been doing body kindness since the day the book came out. There's definitely progress, but a lot of times people wish that there would just be some end point, right? Where everything would be easy and it would just be as effortless as breathing. You don't even have to think about it. I do have some good news for you. The more you practice body kindness, the easier it does get. But you know, life is challenging and we always have different things that come up that make it difficult for us to do what we want to do. And health and well-being and good self-care is no exception. And if you noticed the last uh, time I spoke with Bernie, he was having some difficulties just staying focused on the non-diet approach and uh, self-acceptance. And if you haven't had a chance yet to listen to the entire first season of Body Kindness, I highly recommend you do. Bernie and I are together and you really can see the evolution of what it's his journey was like. And you might find different elements of that resonate with you. Uh, so while I love you jumping in whenever you can with the podcast, Go back and listen to that first season if you're someone who is having some difficulty putting body kindness into practice, and I think you'll find that very helpful. Now that said, I really wanted to offer listeners some focused attention to these roadblocks, and that's why I'm so excited to have the next series for body kindness focus on roadblocks, and you're going to hear from some great folks. We've got best-selling authors. We've got body image influencers, fat activists, and a whole group of wonderful people who really do help shed light on a specific barrier of body kindness. Uh, This first episode, you're going to hear me talk about time and all the different things that can impact our challenges with time. So I'm so excited to share this series with you. If you have questions, comments, please direct them to me, Rebecca at bodykindnessbook.com. And we can continue the conversation in our Facebook group. Because real health is about being good to yourself. It's time for body kindness, the place where all bodies fit and weight is just a number. Hi, I'm Rebecca Scritchfield, author of the book, Body Kindness, registered dietitian, nutritionist, and host of this podcast. My topic today is time confetti. And this topic of time is important to me and body kindness because we all know that time is a limited resource. Uh, There's nothing we can do when the hours are up, they're up. And time is often the reason that we think 
about when we're thinking about why we're not exercising, why we're not cooking more at home or why we're, you know, quote unquote, failing at something for our own health and well-being. It usually comes back to this issue of time. And, you know, in my professional experience, I feel like the articles you read about, it's all designed to help you squeeze more time into things like that. You're always the problem when it comes to time. And that's not necessarily the case. And so what I wanted to do today was just bring the issue of time to light and kind of discuss about things that we can do for ourselves personally, but also some of the unknown uh, cultural pressures that we face that you might not necessarily be thinking about on a daily basis. And my special guest to discuss this today is author Bridget Schulte. Bridget Schulte is a writer and journalist and author of the New York Times bestselling book on time pressure overwhelmed work love and play when no one has the time which named one of the notable books of the year by the Washington Post and NPR and won the Virginia Library Association's literary nonfiction award she has spoken all over the world about the causes and consequences of our unsustainable always on culture and how to make time for the good life by redesigning how we work by reimagining gender roles for a fairer division of labor and opportunity at work and home. And instead of seeking status in busyness, by recapturing the value of a leisure. She was an award-winning journalist for the Washington Post and the Washington Post Magazine, and part of the team that won the 2008 Pulitzer Prize. She now serves as a director of the Better Life Lab at the nonpartisan think tank New America which uses data, storytelling, and policy analysis to show how work-life, work-life redesign, work redesign, and gender equity and updated social policies are key to excellence, productivity, and innovation at work as well as a full, authentic, and meaningful life for everyone. She lives in Alexandria, Virginia with her husband, Tom Bowman, a reporter for the National Public Radio, and their two children. She grew up in Portland, Oregon, and spent her summers with her family in Wyoming, where she did not feel overwhelmed. Bridget, welcome to the show today. <laughs> Thank you so much. Great to, great to be here talking to you, Rebecca. Oh, I'm so excited to have this conversation with you today. I um, So for, for way of background, we, we are with the same literary agency. Yeah. And I want to say your book was newly out when I was needing to put pen to paper. Uh, to write mine, and it was it was a must listen. Uh, one of my time saving techniques is I try to do audiobook when I can, and folk you know do do uh, listening to audiobook with mindless dishes or laundry or other types of activities. And I just was really enthralled. I thought I knew all there was to really know about time and time management, and. I feel like I was one of those perpetrators of, you know, well, just shut up and make it work. Kind of <laughs> no excuses, dietitian counselor person. And it really just opened my eyes to so many things. So it's an amazing book. I want all the listeners, if you haven't already read it in your book clubs or got it, I've mentioned it before on earlier podcasts when I was working with Bernie. Um, it's mentioned in body kindness. And <laughs> yeah, so yeah, no, I just really can't wait to kind of have this rich conversation about about time and time management. Um, but let's kind of get started with the types of things you're currently working on um, and how that relates to time. And then we'll kind of see where the conversation goes. Well, sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much for such kind and generous words. I really appreciate it. And if you remember when I was reporting the book, uh, that's how I first met you because you were really working on a project trying to help people create time for themselves and particularly for women and how much how how much women really struggle with that. So you were a big part. I think you're in my book, too. And that was before your book came out. So great to talk with you. And I'm, I'm happy to uh, talk about all of this. But I will say that um, really the process of writing the book, which was kind of accidental, I never had covered these issues as a reporter. I basically just lived them and then had an opportunity to write a book, kind of fell into it. Uh, and then just like you just like just like you just said, my eyes just really got completely I was just completely stunned. It's like, oh, I just opened my eyes about thinking about things in a really different way. And a lot of that is because we just really haven't 
uh, looked at issues of kind of work and life, we've sort of seen them as kind of quote unquote mommy's issues or women's issues. They're sort of unimportant or sort of soft. And really in doing the research, I see how they're central for everybody. So I really became very passionate and motivated after the book uh, was published. I went back to the Washington Post and for a while I sort of created a coverage area out of this. And then I had had my fellowship uh, when I was writing my book at New America, which is a wonderful, it's a nonpartisan think tank. And as a journalist, that very independent uh, minded, I really like that nonpartisan aspect to it. And it's a think tank that has a lot of journals, a journalism focus to it that really understands the power of combining really good and fresh data with storytelling, powerful and uh, resonant storytelling, that that's really how we understand uh, how we understand our world as humans. So I basically took the all of the things that I learned that were challenges and problems in the book, and I've sort of dedicated my life here at the at New America to trying to figure out well what are the solutions then? It's like what do we do about it? Because this is really unsustainable the way that we're living. And so, for instance, so here at the Better Life Lab, we really work on three things, and you'd mentioned them in the introduction. Um, we, and we see the intersection of all of them when we're talking about how do we all have a good life? And that's all up and down the socioeconomic spectrum. You know, you shouldn't only have the ability to have a good life if you have a lot of money. And by the way, a lot of people who have a lot of money are still pretty miserable. <laughs> you know, that that's not the main goal in life or it shouldn't be. So we really look at work. Work is a huge part of what drives so much overwhelm for people all up and down the socioeconomic spectrum. So we like to talk about, we work on the future of work, like what is work going to look like with automation and, and artificial intelligence, but more importantly, the now of work, because the now of work is really not working for anybody. So we look at how do we redesign work. We look at gender equality because that's huge. You know, women have been graduating from college in greater degrees, greater numbers than men since the 1980s. They get more master's degrees. They have more PhDs. And still women are stuck in the, the middle and lower rungs of management. And the majority of women are really in low wage and uh, poorly paid professions. And even when they're doing the same work with the same experience, there's a gender wage gap. Uh, so there's something really wrong about that. That's that's not only inherently unfair. That's also inherently really stupid. Because if you know if what you want as a business and as a country is economic growth, if you want innovation and you want your smartest people doing the best work, well then you would want to have policies and practices that help support getting those best people into those roles. And that's not happening right now. So we look at that and why that's not happening for women in the workplace. And a big part of that is we need to also look at what's happening with men and the evolution in their role, that no longer do men want to be this distant breadwinner and that the way you prove that you're a good father is that you work a whole lot so you can bring more money home to your family. That really hasn't been true for decades. Uh, so we have to really look at the evolving role of men and men as care caregivers, not only for children, but there's an increasingly um, aging population. And a lot of men are actually very involved in taking care of their parents. So we really look at, um, you know, when we talk about gender equality, we're talking about men and women. And we're also talking across the gender spectrum, you know, uh, people are and, and how we deal with gender fluidity and being very accepting of how people uh, choose to live their lives. And the third area that we work on is social policy. Because in the United States, again, a lot of what drives the overwhelm for a lot of people, particularly if you have family, and, and you know, and it, I describe family very broadly. You have kids. You yourself is, a, you know, you are a family. You know, you have your own health and care that you need to take care of, you know, or aging parents or, you know, you have care in your community. I, you know, again, I think about it that very broadly. It's that whatever connects you to other people, which we know from the research is the basis of human happiness, that connection, making time for that. Well, we have social policies that are downright hostile to, to anyone who wants to do anything other than work all the time. Uh, we really either have no policies that support combining work and family or work and life, or we have really outdated ones that uh, that were that were basically written in the 1930s, kind of in the New Deal era, when families looked very different, and they were they were that sort of breadwinner homemaker family. So right now you've got say tax policy that really favors a breadwinner homemaker family. When the research shows, the data shows that the majority of families today, the majority of children are being raised in families where all parents work. 
So our policies support a family that doesn't exist anymore. And it's really, it just makes things so much more difficult for, for the way people are really living. There's a huge disconnect between the way people are living and, uh, you know, the policies and practice and workplace cultures that we have. So one of the, one of the, um, we've done a lot of really cool work looking at uh, the child care system and really understanding the cost, quality, and availability of child care in all 50 states. We've done a really interesting project using behavioral science to try to understand what drives work-life conflict and how do you design better solutions for it. Uh, and, and we've got a great uh, Better Work Toolkit that's on our website that people can download that's all very evidence-based, so 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 based in data uh, and studies, but is very readable. But So you can take it to your boss and say, here's why we need to have flexible work for everybody. You know, So it's really designed as a tool for people to, uh, at work. And then most recently, we've got a big report coming out that, uh, that asks the question, sort of how much time is enough, talking about our subject of time. Um, you know, right now, the United States is the only uh, country in the world, really, that does not have a paid uh, family leave policy, yeah, unless you count Tonga, Suriname, and Papua New Guinea. <laughs> um, we have an unpaid family leave uh, program, but most, say, most low-wage workers can't afford to take that kind of leave. And so right now there's more and more pressure to have a paid family leave system. There's a really interesting survey that the Pew Research Center just put out that a majority of Americans from right and left, old and young, um, across the political spectrum, really support having a government role for some kind of paid family leave um, system. That if you just leave it up to employers um, voluntarily, that that, that, you know, that that may work for somebody who's in a you know, in a field where there's a war for talent. But if you're a low wage worker, you're very unlikely that your employer would would invest in something like that. And so only 14 percent of the civilian workforce actually has paid family leave. So we were looking at all of this kind of momentum and pressure. Uh, Ivanka Trump's very interested in promoting paid family leave. Uh, there, there is a proposal out of the Trump White House. The Democrats have a proposal in Congress. And so we wanted to ask the question, well, where did 12 weeks come from for the Family Medical Leave Act? And why is disability only six weeks? You know, the temporary disability insurance that some women can get after having a, having a child. You know, what does the science say? Is there or is there science that says here's the right amount of leave? And so what we did is uh, we we worked as a team and we scanned uh, some of the best U.S. and international studies out there and really asked the question, how long should paid family leave be? And we looked at four uh, four different indicators. One is child health and well-being. Um, one is maternal health and well-being. And one is gender equality. And the final one is economic impact. And then we come up with recommendations based on each of those, um, basically what the science shows. And then we've got a really cool timeline that, that will show you, um, you know, kind of like the different milestones and when is it sort of the red zone where it's just not enough to meet basic needs? When is it yellow that it may meet basic needs? And then really what's green? What does the research show is really optimal? Yeah. So this is the vision I had in my head when you were sharing all that wonderful information. It was like I had this visual of I'm in the yard and I'm pulling out the weeds to, <laughs> so that I can actually grow my beautiful garden. And so it's like what you're doing at New America is really trying to get to the root issue of why these weeds are getting in the way of what we would consider. It's not a perfect life. But a good balance of health and happiness that we think human beings should have access to. Well, it's so true. I mean, right now, so many people feel that they do not have time for that. So many people feel completely overwhelmed. Um, you know, if you look at survey data, when people ask, you know, do you feel time, you know, time pressure? Do you feel that you have enough time to do everything you need and want to in a day? You know, the numbers of people who are feeling not only feeling that pressure, but feeling really stressed from it are actually growing. So there is this this sort of sense of breathless, like, <gasps> I don't have enough time. Uh, and if you're just scrambling to try to get through the end of a work day and scrambling to try to get your your kids or your, you know, just get throw some food on the table, it's really hard for people to think about like leisure time, 
joy? Mm-hmm. What are you talking about? Like getting some <laughs> exercise? Forget it. You know, I mean, so many yeah. people, you know, you look at even sleep habits mm-hmm. and, and, you know, believe me, and I say all this, I've done all this research. I'm still a work in progress. Okay. I'm still working on all of these things myself. I've learned a lot of bad habits over my life, but you know, sleep is one thing I really struggle with and that it, you know, there's more and more research that shows how critical that is. And yet there's fewer and fewer people getting ac- adequate sleep. So yeah, we are really in uh, kind of this, um, I don't want to call it a death spiral, but we're in a pretty bad place and, and we need to pull out. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, the more overwhelmed you feel as an individual, the more this negative voice continues to pop up and it takes the tone of this is hopeless or why bother, right? And so, <laughs> so, 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 I mean, your sense of agency, your sense of, I have control in this situation, or there's something I can do to make this situation better is, is low, right? So like from, from my standpoint, that person's not even Googling DC area nutrition experts or anything like that, because it's like, this situation is hopeless, not even thinking about it. But then when people do, okay, they're motivated to some type of action because they want to make a change in their life, you know, consistently time comes up as a major barrier for why they're feeling like they're not going to get out of the current place they're in. And I think there's a part of it that is humans, they do want to do it all, right? So we think, okay, I've got to hit the sleep bucket, the exercise bucket, the food bucket, because if I can't do all of this and look hot in my bikini, forget (laughs) it. (laughs) Yeah, right, right. So there is this sort of like, what can I take action on today while I am aware that this entire system is set up to work against me? Yeah, no, that's a really great question. And that is one thing that I found in my reporting and I continue to find this sort of sense of despair that, and I honestly, I felt that way before I started reporting on my book. I thought, well, I just made this choice to be a working mother. So my life is crazy. And that's just the way that it has to be. You know, I I never exercised. I broke out in stress eczema. And when I asked my doctor why, he just shrugged. It's just like, oh, it's not my job to tell you why you're stressed out here. Here's some cream. (laughs) I was like, I just, I really did. And it's, I, I loved my kids, but I felt like I was kind of like living on the sidelines and my life was rushing past me. And I just, uh, and I couldn't sleep and I always was feeling guilty and inadequate, you know, and it was just, that's a tough way to live. And uh, on the other hand, it's like, oh my God, and I've got education and I've got a great job. And, you know, I'm one of the quote unquote lucky ones. I should be wildly happy. Why, you know, why do I feel so stressed and, you know, and kind of so bad all the time? And I really, it took reporting on this book to really understand it and then to see how things could be different. You know, I asked sort of two questions. Why are things the way they are and how can they be better? And really use my skills as a reporter and an investigative journalist to not just kind of have the platitudes. I mean, I love those, the seven ways to do this, the 10 ways to do that. But really look at, at the, at really look for bright spots uh, that were already existing out there. And I did find them. There are places where work, places where, where work is, is totally restructured. Uh, you know, so many people feel like they spend all their days uh, answering emails, answering the phone, being on the phone and going to meetings. And then so then the work day ends five, six, seven o'clock, whatever that is for you. And then they feel like, oh, I haven't even started my work, my real work. And so then what do they do? They take their work home and then they work in the evenings and then they get really tired and then they start off at a deficit the next day and then they don't get all their work done by Friday. So then they take it home over the weekend. So work creeps. And what we're finding is a couple reasons why. One is that work is designed really inefficiently. And another is that humans with behavioral science, we're really bad at planning things. We're really bad at estimating how long things are going to take. We continually think, oh, I can do that in an hour and it'll take you five. So one of the things that is, you know, a couple things, and you'd mentioned a couple, a couple points that are really important. You know, sometimes when you look at what needs to change, social policy, work culture, gender equality, attitudes, it can seem overwhelming. And that's where starting small is so important. Because if you can start small with just one thing in your own life, then what you're doing is you're putting on your own oxygen mask. And then when you are able to breathe, then you can see more clearly. And then you can say, ah, now I can help 
this one person here and then they can help this one person there. That's how you get larger change. You know, some people can go, you can run for office, you can you can work on that big change. That's awesome. But sometimes I think it's so important for people to remember start small and start with yourself. And, you know, you know, you think about, you know, yeah, I have to sleep. Now I got to meditate. Oh my God, I got to do this. I got to uh, eat. You got to detox, you know, do one thing. And I, I loved it. You know, people think, you know, mindfulness certainly does bring a lot of great benefits, health, you know, mental health benefits, physical health benefits. And so I talked to this one mindfulness teacher and I just said, oh my God, it's just one more thing on my list to do. Are you kidding? How can I find time to meditate? Ah! And she was wonderful. She just said, you know, I felt that way after she had her child. And she said, I made a deal with myself that I would make time for this kind of reflection every day, but I had a back door and that was, it didn't matter how long. And so I take that and I run with it. You know, so this, this teacher, Tara Brock, she had said, so some days it would literally be, I'd be sitting on the side of my bed thinking, oh, I didn't meditate today. I would take five deep breaths. Ah, that was enough. And I, you know, I love that. Uh, Christine Carter is another writer. She's just written a book called The Sweet Spot. And she talks about sort of you know, making the most of uh, even small little changes. So she has this, it's, I still use it. She calls it a microwave or micro workout. You know, if you don't have time to do that five mile run or that, you know, hour long power yoga class or even going for a walk, 20 push ups, 20 sit ups, 20 squats, you're done. You did something and maybe even do them while you brush your teeth. So, you know, <laughs> Squatting why. while I'm brushing. Don't that's laugh. A good, that, no, that but that's a good idea, idea actually. <laughs> I'm going to hold a wall sit while I swish my mouthwash. I do. I do 20, I do 20 squats when I brush my teeth every morning. <laughs> Don't laugh. <laughs> but, you know, but I think that's, that's important. You know, again, I, since I've been reading a lot about behavioral science, that feeling of overwhelm can be so powerful. There's actually a term for it. Uh, they, uh, you know, when you feel like you, there's uh, something lacking, whether it's time or money or you just get sort of this breathless, you get to kind of this where you're always busy and you're always worried and you think about it, you're sort of like on this, uh, this treadmill and you're, they call it tunneling. And if you think about it, you're just going further and further and further into the dark. And as you tunnel, your, your line of sight, your vision becomes even narrower and darker so that you can only see the little tiny things right in front of you. And it's really harder to kind of like take that breath and I'm sort of thinking of a prairie dog kind of popping up out of that tunnel and seeing that bigger picture. So, and, and, and the one thing I'll say is that there have been studies that have found that when you're in that tunneling mode, your IQ actually drops 13 points, you know? So think about it. It's like being really super busy and tunneling. No wonder we can't make good decisions. We're just not able to. And so sometimes creating that space, even if it's just five minutes, even if it's just 20 squats while you're brushing your teeth, but you're creating a little bit of space for yourself, for yourself to breathe, that's the start. And that's how things can start opening up. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. I want to go back to something you mentioned earlier about work creeping. And I can definitely relate to the, I <laughs> felt like you were describing me. I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> she's in my brain. So from one perspective, I can see the issue is if you tightly find your value to your worthiness in the world as work success, then part of that is going to be you're going to have this voice in your head that's like, oh, if you don't do it, then, you know, you weren't good enough in your job today or someone else might get that, you know. So it's sort of this fear driven, kind of like driven by fear, but also you've seen where you do find the work rewarding, but then it becomes it's almost that's your attachment, right? Like you become attached to doing that work. But then to your point about all the cultural pressures and everything, it's also the reality that women are stuck in these middle of the road. Uh, management type job so it's belief rooted in how you see yourself that's like driven by reality which you can't leave your job that day <laughs> or you you know there probably will be cases where you can't just do what you really want to do which is like take an immediate vacation or but like what could somebody do like let's talk about that whole kind of work creep scenario and sort of like how can we set some better 
boundaries around that particular issue that where you think that kind of maybe people could do that, make that little change while they, like you said, print out a report for their boss and try to get some more like a better work life environment. Right, right. And there are more things that you could do than 20 squats at the uh, printing machine. (laughs) (laughs) Right. No, that's a really, that's a great question because a lot of people are really struggling with work creep. There's actually research that shows that the United States, workers in the United States work more odd hours, uh, weekends and evenings than, uh, than workers in other countries. So we have sort of let work kind of encroach on what had been family time or time for yourself, time to refresh your soul, rejuvenate, leisure time, um, that that is uh, slowly eroding. Well, some of that is because of our, you know, our digital nature, you know, uh, the, the wonderful things that technology has brought uh, the, with, in, in terms of being in communication with others now that you means that you can be connected all the time. And then uh, what happens is, um, this is driven largely by kind of cultural pressure, as you had mentioned earlier, that still today, um, the research shows that the, the workers we tend to value the most are the workers, we call it the ideal worker who's always on, always answering those emails at 11 o'clock at night. They're first in the morning, they're late at night, they're FaceTime, uh, you know, warriors in the office, you know, and we say, oh boy, they're the best workers. And the research shows that they tend to be rewarded. They tend to be promoted. They tend to get the better salaries, even though they may not be doing the best work. And because they don't tend to be doing the caregiving, they tend to be men. And so, so we've created this sort of structure that perpetuates this notion that men are the ideal worker and they don't have to do anything other than work all the time. And I think that, you know, that's part of what drives that, like, oh, my God, I better work like crazy to keep up with Bob because everybody thinks Bob is amazing. Well, let me tell you right now, there was this really fascinating Harvard Business Review um, uh, that was pub- this research that was published in Harvard Business Review and it basically showed it was a study in this one uh, kind of knowledge workplace that showed that it's not like Bob is working 80 hours, but Bob is really good at pretending to work 80 hours. And so everybody thinks that Bob is working 80 hours. They reward him for that. You may be working 80 hours because you're, you know, you're at the office and you're feeling guilty and then you're stretched and then you go home and you put the kids to bed and then you go back to work and then you're really tired and you get up really early and you do some more work. So you may actually, and that's probably I, truthfully more my experience. I wasn't always in the office, but I was always putting in crazy hours, but because people didn't see me. They didn't give me credit for it. So that's one thing to remember is that th- that is a recipe for failure right there. Because first of all, if you're a woman, you're never, ever going to be considered as uh, good a worker as Bob. Because if you put in those kind of hours and you're a mom, they're going to think, oh, you are just a terrible mother. You're not the ideal worker. You're going to be punished for working those hours. If you're a single woman, they'll think, oh, boy, wouldn't want to, you know, date her. So, you know, it's kind of like this double bind because of our unconscious gender bias. Um, so I think rather than thinking, okay, I'm going to compete with Bob. I'm going to work really, really hard. I'm going to show how hard I work. It's actually a wonderful term for that. It's called the tiara syndrome. I'm going to work really, really, really hard. And then people will just crown me. They will give me this tiara and recognize how hard I work. And believe me, I waited for that damn tiara for many years. (laughs) You just have to be like, forget the tiara. Always the runner up, never the queen. (laughs) Never the tiara, never. So I think what's really important in that instance is to kind of like flip that on its head and recognize that in the jobs for the future, you know, we're all going to be working flexibly and digitally. We're all going to have like Alexa, you know, (laughs) answering our questions. And it's going to be a very different world. And you can sort of get a jump start on that. So don't try to compete with Bob and put in more hours and think that's the right way to do it. Because that's actually the road to burnout. That's actually the road to not having the opportunity for the best ideas. Because the research shows that you get your best ideas when you are well rested and in a relaxed state. Honest to God, they found this through PET scans and fMRIs. There's an actual moment of insight that comes through the right side of your brain when you're relaxed. There is a reason why you get your best ideas in the shower. So the more that, so the more you can kind of create that space, the more you're going to have like, oh, why don't I solve the problem this way? Or like, oh, we could try that. 
it doesn't, those ideas don't come when you're tired and you're grinding it out at your desk. So the more we recognize that, I think what's important, so thinking about yourself then and work creep and how you set your day. So the first thing you do is create that space, five breaths, and just kind of get clear on what's really the most important thing for you to do at work this week. What is your priority? You know, it can be anything, big or small. What is the most important thing that you want to make sure you get done by Friday? Figure out what that is and then go to your schedule and put that Put, give it a place and figure, okay, it's going to take two hours and find those two hours on your schedule. Put that in your schedule. And then every week create Slack. A lot of people do that on Friday. I create Slack on Fridays because every week there's going to be something unexpected that comes up, a surprise, the shit's going to hit the fan, something's going to happen that's going to knock you off your game. And maybe that one hour that you dedicated to your most important project got eaten up by meetings that you hadn't expected. Well, if you've already scheduled Slack, then that time moves to the Slack time. And then you create, then you do that so that by the time the end of Friday comes, if you've done your one most important thing, you're much more likely to be able to say, ah, time to cl- turn off the computer and go home. Yeah. Well, and, and as I'm listening to you talk, it's also making me think about, we also need to talk about our internal judgments, Right. Because I am so on board with what you're saying. When I have a client, we talk about meal prep and stuff and they they think in one hour they can meal plan, grocery shop prep and kind of be yeah. good. And I'm like, no, it's going to be an hour just at the store. So on your calendar, put two because you're going to drive. You're going to get stuck in an aisle where you're comparing cans of tuna fish for whatever reason. And like if you come back ahead of schedule, celebrate that surprise free time or continue on and get the surprise free time later, but you will constantly fail if you overbook yourself. So totally on board with that, but I can hear judgments coming up for people when they're like, wait a minute, just one one important thing I'm supposed to get done, like that's not going to sound like enough. Or that voice just gets louder. Oh, well, you know, you did this one thing, but look at all these other things you didn't do. And and I really just think we all need more self-compassion there. But I'm just curious what you have found in your, you know, because you were kind of like, always struggling and had that critic and through your book work and research kind of changed the way that you operate, even still a work in progress. But what, what shifted there from, from, from judgment and criticism to like more understanding? Well, first of all, that judgment and criticism, it doesn't ever go away. We all have that inner critic. I mean, I think that's just part of human nature to feel like we're never good enough, that we can never do enough. And so I think the difference is how much are you going to listen to that voice? I like to think about it more as turning down the volume. (laughs) You know, I'm never going to get rid of that inner critic. You know, boy, you know, he was talking to me pretty loudly last night about three in the morning, you know? Um, So then you find strategies for dealing with it. And, you know, and, and sometimes that means, I love the the meditation uh, called rain where you, you know, you recognize you have difficult feelings. You allow them that that's just, you know, difficult feelings are just as much a part of the human nature as, as excellent and happy feelings, you know, don't fight it, then investigate it in your body. Well, what does it feel like? And is it hot? Are you clenching? And, And just kind of get more curious about what's happening in your body and then start breathing and let it go. Kind of just kind of stop the story the story kind of fuels it. And, you know, boy, the story can just go on and on. And we can imagine. I mean, the wonderful thing about humans is that we have the ability to imagine. And the terrible thing about humans is that we have the ability to, to imagine because we tend to imagine catastrophes happening to ourselves. <laughs> you know, and that <laughs> the usually, worst thing that could happen is going to happen right yeah. now. <laughs> and so we, we kind of work ourselves up into a panic. And I believe me, I say this because I've had a lot of practice doing it. <laughs> So it's a, it, that, that's a real practice. So I think that's the important thing is like, don't try to like, it's like cutting off your arm, you know, and that sometimes that critic might have something, some information that you need to hear. Maybe it's something that's hard, but you do need to face. And, you know, I think that you're right. It's how do you face it with compassion? And this is going to sound really crazy, but after I do the rain and it kind of like stop the story in my head and my, my heart rate comes down and I can breathe. 
I then, uh, I just start, uh, you know, t- people sometimes think of counting sheep. I start counting my blessings. I start thinking of everything I'm really grateful for. And I start thinking like just in the last 24 hours. So it's not sort of like vague, but very specific. And it can be like, I am so grateful for that wonderful cup of coffee this morning. You know, It can be everything small from like, I'm so grateful, you know, that I had this time with my daughter or I'm so grateful my son called. And I'm so grateful my, you know, my husband's happy with this. I'm so grateful my father's doing better, you know? Um, so, and I think that really shifts it when we kind of shift into thinking uh, rather than uh, kind of focusing on self-criticism, which is so easy to do. I mean, our brains are really wired for that. You know, when you think about it, our brains have not really changed much uh, since Cro-Magnon days, honest to God. There's a research that shows that we're reaching what, what they call channel capacity. You know, we just we, there's just too much happening and too much information, and our brains simply can't process it all. But our brains were evolved to protect us. And so that meant that we were always scanning for threats. What's the worst thing that could happen so we could protect ourselves? What's the, what's the scariest thing out there that could eat me? And so the thing is, our, you know, we're not in physical danger from being eaten by a lion every day anymore. But our brains are still habituated to scanning for negative uh, you know, scanning for the negative, it's all designed to protect us so that if we can shift to thinking about everything that's, that we're grateful for, then it actually, it really does shift your mood. It shifts the way you, you think, and it actually starts changing the structure of your brain to have a more positive outlook. And I know a lot of times I, I, what I used to think is like, oh, that's so Pollyannish. I need to be really hard on myself if I'm ever, if I'm ever going to improve. I need to like whip myself even harder. I need than my I, perfectionism. Know. My perfectionism is functional. No, it's not. It's not. And I say that as a recover. I say I'm a, I'm a recovering workaholic. I'm a recovering helicopter parent. I'm a recovering perfectionist. Yeah, because because it really doesn't get you anywhere. And all it does is leave you very unsatisfied with where you are. And uh, if we can start looking at what's really good with where we are right here, right now, uh, that can change, uh, changes your mindset, it changes your energy, uh, and then it makes it easier to take those smaller steps. Yeah, I could not agree with you more. Just, I feel like the layers in which we look at it are very complementary and aligned. You know, this idea that we're not trying to say that you can have a stress-free world because that just doesn't exist. So first of all, even getting clear with like, what are your expectations for where you could see what a good life, what a better life looks like to you and being able to get some amount of clarity around that. And I'm sure there's buckets around personal self-care, family, work. You know, we're not saying you have to ignore work, but knowing, right, the system that's set up to suck any amount of your mental energy and physical time, it's set up to make you think that that's what you have to do. Now that you know that, you can go in and say, okay, well, what is a realistic middle ground that I could try to find so I can take some of my time back? And I think it is even if, like you mentioned fear, even if you are afraid, I'm not going to get that promotion. I'm not going to get that accolade. You never really know until you try to give yourself the boundaries around work that you need and that better life that you crave. Because I can tell you from both personal experience and years and years of working with clients, nobody eats emotionally and sues with food because they don't have awareness that the entire row of cookies isn't a good idea. You know, like we all know it's not a knowledge problem or, oh, I need another drink tonight, you know? And so even we're not saying, I mean, yes, depression is associated, anxiety is associated and it could become alcoholism, but it doesn't have to even be that extreme. It could be that you're taking an extra drink or two to, to numb or sue the daily stress. But then when that happens, the chips and hummus and salsa and cheeses come out. And so, and a lot of times where I get it and I don't like my reflection and that's why my life sucks. And it's like that layer of, if we could be nice to the bodies we have now, even if we want them to change, even if we're disappointed in how we're taking care of ourselves, if we can be kind and be nice to ourselves, but try to identify the real problems where we're letting go of self-blame and self-shaming and that judgment and trying to carve this different way out, which I think you nailed at the very beginning, it's about taking action. How can I consistently 
instantly take action in a way that I think is going to work for me. And I get the sense that your sort of transformation wasn't like this black and white. One day you were one way and one day you were next. That There was actually like an evolution. So could you share a little bit about that so people understand that it's not like follow these seven steps and everything will be perfect. No, goodness, no. And I think, you know, this is a great thing. A couple of things that I'd love to share is uh, one thing that really helped me a lot. You were talking about clarity. Uh, Peter Senge writes about this a lot in the fifth di- discipline. He calls it the two hands method. So if you put your hands facing each other, you know, a little bit d- a distance apart and on one hand is where you are, your current reality, and then get really clear on where that is. And then on your other hand, that's, you know, that's kind of where you want to go. That's your vision of what you'd really like at work, love, play. Uh, and so then what you do is you think, OK, well, what's an, one experiment that I can try to get from here to there? And so that's really the principle that I used a lot when I was thinking about how to change. You know, so I did. I was I was not feeling good about myself. And so I thought, well, how how can I how can I work out? I have two little kids. Mornings are crazy. Once I get to work, I'm just gone. I work late. I have crazy deadlines. Editors are calling at all hours. Then I got to come home and, you know, then kids and, you know, food and baths and bed and, you know, story time. And then I'm exhausted Uh, And that's certainly not the time I want to work out. So I started really small and I got, I took my kids. We used to have this uh, DVD player in the car, uh, you know, for long car trips. And I took the kids DVD player and I got a couple Gunnar Peterson, like 20, 30 minute workouts with a, like a exercise ball and some weights. And I just said, that's enough. And actually, that's what I did this morning. I did a 30 minute, you know, workout in my bedroom. And sometimes I would do it. My husband would still be asleep. (laughs) Sometimes I would do it like right after he got up. But, you know, I started really small with like 20 minutes and it wasn't every day. It was like a couple of times a week. And then over time, it grew into a routine. It grew into a habit. And now, you know, over the weekend, I ran a a crazy 10K in um, a a, a trail race, you know, on the trail. That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah. And I, I, I pretty regularly run half marathons, but that started really small with like starting with an exercise tape in my bedroom on my kids DVD, (laughs) you know, uh, first thing in the morning. So that's, that's kind of one, you know, one thing I also, I totally embrace Tara Brock, you know, some, I will try to make time for kind of reflection, but there are plenty of days that I don't, I wish I did. And I don't. So I, I'll sit on the edge of my bed at the end of the evening. It's like, Oh, I never did meditate five breaths. Okay, done. Sometimes even I'm even laying down when I do it. But you know, I think that that's, it's sort of creating space no matter how long it is, you know, that sure, 20 minutes is ideal. I don't have 20 minutes. I've got five breaths and that's, that's good enough. And I think um, one of the things that I, uh, you know, from some of the research I've been doing on behavioral science that I think is so powerful, and this is particularly true when it comes to like nutrition, um, Dan Arelli, who's a behavioral economist at Duke, I was interviewing him for a podcast I was doing. And he said, you know, human freedom is not in our ability to make decisions. It's in our ability to put ourselves in an environment that will lead to to better outcomes. So a lot of times people think, oh, if I'm not eating well, I'm not exercising, or I'm not doing things with my time, that it's a failure, a failure of willpower, that there's something wrong with me. And if I just had more of this or I was stronger, I could do better. And really what, you know, kind of what we need to understand is that all human beings, we make sort of predictably bad decisions. You know, we're, we're, we're very much, they call it present biased. We have a hard time imagining the future or making a decision now that will be um, better for us in the long run. You know, like it's, it's harder to say, no, I, uh, no, I will not eat that chocolate. It looks so delicious. You know, because in the future, I don't, I'm not going to like the way, way it makes me feel. So sometimes think about creating systems that make it easier for you to make those better choices. You know, for me, that means uh, if I bring fruits and vegetables home, I cut them up and I put them at eye level. I don't leave them in the vegetable drawer. I'll make sure that I have almond butter and apples because that's a great snack rather than crackers and cheese for me. Uh, and so uh, so think about uh, creating systems. What I'm working on right now is bedtime because I need to work on sleep. I have a hard time with sleep. So, uh, you know, I'm trying to create, how do you create the environment and create create habits that then become routines that are going to serve you better over the long run. Yeah, I think that that's exactly right, that it's the more you can separate 
the use of your time in self-criticism and blaming, the more free time you actually have to come up with a plan where, you know, you don't have to have certainty of that outcome. It's nice when you, the higher hope and confidence you have is, is helpful because you're more likely to take an action, but taking those risks so that in the future, that choice that you need to make is easier. You know, a lot of times we'll say, you know, make the healthy choice, the easier choice or something like that, that you don't have to overthink it or you don't have to say, well, that can't happen for these seven two reasons because you've actually already kind of set up your environment and your system more to make it more likely that you'll actually make those choices. So, right. You know, and there's one thing I I just wanted to come back to, you know, when we talk about work, I think a lot of us feel like unless we work like a maniac, we're somehow working less or we're, you know, we're making a trade off or we're like, we'll do mediocre work. And I think what I'm finding and what the research is showing is that actually working smarter, working more effectively, not longer hours, actually leads to better work. You know, when you create space for that free thinking or fresh thinking to come in, you're actually going to do better work. When you are rested and you are happy, you're actually more productive. When you're in a positive mood, I mean, all of this is research-based. When you're in a positive mood, your performance actually increases. So I think rather than think, oh, my God, uh, you know, unless I work like Bob the maniac, you know, 80 hours a week, you know, somehow I'm going to be less than. I think, you know, mindset is so important. You know, really shift that mindset to embrace the notion that effective work is really the best work. And the way to do effective work is to get clear on what your priorities are schedule them and, you know, make sure that you've got concentrated, uninterrupted time to do it. People think, and listen, I'm a huge, uh, I, a huge purveyor that, you know, it's like inbox zero. I mean, I thought, <laughs> oh, I got to get to inbox zero and I feel so terrible and I'm behind and I got so many emails to answer. And then I saw somebody describe uh, your inbox as basically a repository of everybody else's priorities. And I thought, oh, that is so true, isn't it? So if you spend your days responding to your email thinking it's going to make you feel better that your inbox is cleared out, you haven't done anything to move your own priorities forward. So think about that, you know, and make maybe make cleaning out your inbox something you do as sort of part of your admin work, but really make sure that your priority, what's going to move you forward, what's going to give you a sense of meaning, put that in your calendar. And over the long run, it's going to make your, your performance better. And that's what gets you noticed. And that's what gets, uh, you know, that's what moves you forward in your career and your, and your job and your life. Mm -hmm. That and also helps you reframe how much you value it. I love my work. It's not that. But, you know, it changes over time. The more you accomplish, the more you kind of wonder what's next and all this stuff. But also the more you really value, it's not like the whole world is ahead of you. It's like, how do I enjoy this year? How do I get more out of this month? And you start to also realize that maybe you don't want you know, your reflection to be, oh, I'm so glad I put in all those extra hours in the office. <laughs> and then that, and, and that reframe then helps you motivate, okay, I'm doing well, I'm getting my paycheck, and I'm also having a better life because I'm making time for me. I'm doing a good job at taking good care of myself, and I've gotten over that perfectionism, hopefully. <laughs> Well, you know, the the last thing I kind of wanted to mention is uh, when I was still at the Washington Post, I ran this really, really interesting experiment. We called it the Time Hacker Challenge. And we let readers write in like with a goal they really wanted to make time for, why it was important to them and what was getting in the way. And then I matched them up with uh, time management experts, productivity experts, you know, um, coaches. You know, I had a, a whole um, group of people who'd agreed to um, basically donate their services. And then uh, they would work together for 21 days. And at the end of the 21 days, I'd interview both of them, the coach and the and the, the person who wanted to make time for a goal and, you know, kind of like wrote their takeaways, like what had happened? What did they learn? What were the what were the steps that were really helpful? And I will tell you, after doing it for several months, one thing really struck me is that all the tips and the tricks were great. And if you go online, I think they're still all all online and they're really fun to read. I was like, I I couldn't wait to do them because it's like I got to learn. Like, oh, I'm going to try that next time. So they're really helpful. But I think the, the thing that really struck me over time is that it almost didn't matter what the tips or tricks or tools were. The only way that people actually began to make time for this goal that was important to them is when they gave themselves permission to believe it was worth doing. 
And that really struck me. It was their mindset that needed to shift, not their willpower, not some special habit or tool or routine. They needed to believe that making time for what they really wanted was just as important as going to work or just as important as all the kind of like drudge work and duties. And a lot of the stuff they wanted to make time for was sort of fun and lovely and, you know, finding time to go hiking again or learning how to play the guitar or all of the things that we're talking about in terms of living a good life. And they didn't feel that it was worthy because here in the United States, we don't tend to value that time. We value people being busy and working all the time. And so that's a, I mean, I think that's important to recognize that that's a hard thing to do and that, you know, to give yourself that permission can really be life-changing. Yeah. I know it was for me and I know it was for you because I read The Overwhelm and now hopefully all the listeners are going to either read it for the first time or enjoy it again. It's been so wonderful to talk to you today, Bridget. Um, Where can folks kind of connect with you online or kind of keep track of all the good work you're putting out these days? Yeah, a couple ways. So I've got my own website, BridgetSchulte.com, and I do have a newsletter. I send out very irregularly, no more than four times a year, just because I don't want to junk up people's inbox. So usually only if I have something really important to say that I think will be helpful. Um, so that's one way. I've got a, a Facebook page where I um, I post occasionally because, again, I try not to soak up all my time with, with social media, but I really, I really value connecting with people. Um, I do have email, but please don't email me unless, you're really, <laughs> unless you really need something because I try not because to it's their too, priority and not yours <laughs> because I try not to get too overloaded. Yes. Um, but Facebook, I'm on Twitter, Bridget mm-hmm. Schulte, and my Facebook page is Bridget Schulte. And then here at the Better Life Lab, we actually have a better we have a newsletter called Your Life Better uh, that we put out every other week, and they can you can sign up to subscribe to the newsletter. Follow it. We've got a website, the Better Life Lab at New America. We've got all sorts of really great reports and resources, and and we've got our own uh, Better Life Lab at gmail.com. So we're always looking for people to share stories and their thoughts and stuff that they think we should be doing and uh, and why. And so we really welcome that kind of uh, interaction, and we want to build an, uh, a network of people who care about these things and and really make some change. Yeah. Thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. I'll be sure to include all those wonderful, useful links in the show notes as well. Great. Thank you so much. And that's our show. Thank you so much for listening. I would love if you could take a minute and leave a rating and review on iTunes. I know they don't make it very easy, so I have a few quick tips for you. Uh, First, launch the Apple Podcast app, and then you're going to click the search button to enter the name Body Kindness, uh, and you'll find my podcast. You'll see the album art. And when you click on the album art, there is going to be a button in the middle at the top. Uh, It's called Reviews. Click that. And then when you scroll to the bottom, you will see an option to uh, leave a review. And so you'll click that button and go ahead and write your thoughts. I also would love ideas for future episodes. You can email me, Rebecca at bodykindnessbook.com. Again, that's Rebecca at bodykindnessbook.com. I love chatting about the show and how it's helpful. And so keep those emails coming. And also, if you are not yet completed with the e-course, don't forget that's a free resource for anyone who's interested in practicing body kindness. If you visit bodykindnessbook.com and click on get started, just enter in your name and email and you'll get instant access. I'll see you there.